this session will be discuss about the new frontier in Tabi. Very, I hope it's very exciting because it is for the new frontiers. Uh, the first announcer will be Dr. Andrea Pop from Amita Health Alexian Brothers Behavioral Health Hospital. He will discuss with for the same day discharge after Tabi. Please, Dr. Pop. Hi, uh, my name is Andre Pop. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, in Illinois. I'm the head of the uh, structural program for Ascension Illinois. And uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about same day discharge for TAVR. Same day discharge for TAVR has been done since 2015 when the first case report was presented. Um, between 2015 and 2020, the cases reported in the literature were very rare, sporadic, and most patients who are treated with uh, TAVR and underwent same day discharge were patients with pacemakers. Um, it's not until the COVID pandemic started that people started seriously looking at doing uh, TAVI in patients uh, without pacemakers and sending them home the same day. Next day discharge is currently routine in the United States. Um, the the uh, first uh, same day cases uh, reported uh, in uh, 2015 were just single patients. And as you can see from my slide, there were extremely few patients that were treated uh, early on and there were extremely few case reports. Um, in 2020, the number of reports started going up. 2021, we had more reports. And in 2022, we had uh, also uh, a significant higher number than uh, before. So why do same day discharge? Um, Today, many percutaneous procedures are moving to same-day discharge. We started in my institution uh, a PCI program for same-day discharge in 2011. And we currently do uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, EP procedures, watchman procedures, mitral clips, and we're sending a significant number of these patients home the same day. Um, with TAVR in particular, complications have been decreasing and the most complications happen at very predictable time and in a very predictable fashion. Once COVID hit in 2020, we needed to conserve resources. We needed to avoid overnight admission and protect ICU beds for uh, COVID patients and for other patients. And we had reduced availability of uh, staff to care for these patients. At Alexian Brothers, uh, we designed a protocol. We did this uh, between uh, March and June of 2020. Uh, at the same time, we had adopted a very minimalistic TAVR approach, similar to the 3M protocol reported uh, by the group in Vancouver. Um, we started by um, focusing on early ambulation. Uh, patients initially were in bed for six hours. Uh, currently, they only spend four hours in bed. Again, this is uh, very much influenced by the 3M uh, protocol from uh, Dr. Wood and all in Vancouver. Uh, we developed a very strict protocol for avoiding late conduction system issues. Uh, when you talk to people about same day discharge, most people are concerned about late presentation of conduction system problems such as AV block and complete heart block. Um, initially, we started with 100% of the patients having an in-person visit the next day. Uh, later on, we moved to a virtual visit and currently uh, all patients who go home for same day discharge have a virtual visit the next day. Um, another very important point is that none of these patients are discharged unless the entire team is in agreement. We have to have the MDs in agreement, we have to have the RNs and the APN. And I cannot overemphasize the role of the bedside RN, the nurse that's at the bedside with a patient, because these nurses are very experienced and they know if there are problems, they can uh, see if the patients are weak, if the patients have problems, and um, they can um, uh, basically give us insight that we as physicians may not have. 
Also, the, the family has to be in agreement. Patient has to have a support structure at home to be able to go home. Um, when we designed this program, our main objectives were to avoid overnight complications uh, and to avoid readmissions. You can argue that uh, anything that happens after about 24, 48 hours cannot be assigned to same day discharge. But just out of an excess of caution, we looked at not only uh, same day discharge, 24 hour outcomes, but we also looked at our 30 day outcomes. We did the first case in June of 2020. Uh, in the first six months, we did 29 cases. And as of July 1st, 2022, we've had 101 cases. This is what uh, our protocol looks like. Um, the, uh, uh, this is from our initial publication of 29 patients. As you can see, 0% of our patients had vascular access complications and 0% had uh, late conduction abnormalities. Also, most importantly, in the days of COVID, and this is why we designed the protocol, none of these patients went to critical care and none of these patients acquired COVID while in the hospital. This was very important to us. The protocol has evolved since we started in June 2020. The hospital stay initially was mandated to be eight hours. Now it's down to six hours. Um, we removed the requirements uh, for patients to be close to our facility because we are the hub of a large hospital system with 10 other hospitals. And after a while, we figured out that as long as the patient lived close enough to some hospital in our network, they didn't have to be close to us to participate in the protocol. Uh, basically, should the patient get a groin access complication or should a patient get a uh, late AV block, that can be handled in a local hospital as long as we're involved remotely. Um, we also simplified the post-op uh, workup. So basically, we eliminated the blood work uh, that we used to mandate uh, before discharge because we found that there's no benefit uh, and we never uh, changed anything based on the blood work. And we also uh, do a single echo on the table in the procedure room and we do not repeat another echo later on. This is uh, the publication that we had with the first uh, 29 patients published in Structural Heart. Um, based on our protocol and in collaboration with Emory University and um, with University of British Columbia and several other uh, sites in the US and internationally, we designed this Protect TAVR study, which uh, ended up uh, reporting uh, more than 120 patients, out of which we contributed uh, about uh, half the patients. Uh, these are the data from the Protect uh, TAVR patients. As you can see, we had 124 patients that were discharged home uh, the same day and uh, the rate of readmissions was extremely low uh, and uh, we had no uh, serious complications uh, related to uh, the procedure. Uh, the rate of pacemaker uh, after TAVI was extremely low at 0.8%. This is uh, another paper looking at uh, same-day discharge. This is based on the Cleveland Clinic experience. Uh, to date, to our knowledge, this is the largest publication from any uh, single center. Um, again, uh, the outcomes in the data from uh, Cleveland Clinic are uh, truly excellent. As you can see, um, the severe readmissions are low, uh, non-severe readmissions are low, and uh, pacemaker implantations are low. And all of these are very much comparable uh, with patients who are being discharged next day or patients who uh, were being discharged next day before the pandemic. So really it's same day discharge doesn't really seem to influence outcomes in any meaningful way. The economics of same day discharge are something that is being uh, debated and discussed. Uh, this is a paper that um, was recently published uh, looking at uh, registry data. And it basically showed that 30 day readmissions was similar to standard of care. 
uh, that the hospital costs uh, were estimated to be significantly lower with same day discharge versus regular care. And while it is not addressed in this paper, but it's a very important question that we're focusing on is how is same day discharge going to affect staffing levels? Um, worldwide, we're, uh, we're experiencing staffing shortages and uh, we're certainly uh, affected by this in the US. Uh, across the board, multi uh, all hospitals have problems with staffing. And if you have a patient that will spend another 12 hours in the hospital or 16 hours in the hospital uh, to be discharged the next day, that is uh, one to two shifts of nurses that have to take care of the patient that may be able to focus their energy somewhere else. So where do we go from here? Um, in our experience, based on our current protocol, about 20 to 25% of patients qualify for same day discharge. I believe in our institution, we're at about 22% of patients being discharged same day since we started in June of 2020. Um, in my mind, using the current technology, uh, it's unlikely that more than 30 to 35% of the patients will qualify for same day discharge. Um, if we introduce new technologies such, such as temporary pacemakers, which are in development with several companies, that number may be higher, but at least with current technology, 30 to 35% would be tremendous. Uh, if a third of the patients could go home the same day safely, that would be a major achievement. Um, patients with first degree AV block, we started looking at them uh, as possible candidates for same day discharge. Patients with baseline left bundle branch block may be candidate in the future, as long as they don't have uh, further prolongation of their AV conduction or further prolongation of their um, interventricular conduction delay. Uh, we have started looking tentatively at first degree AV block. We are not currently discharging patients with baseline left bundle branch block as part of our program. So, Part of the question is, this has worked well during the COVID pandemic. Uh, should we continue looking at same day discharge after the pandemic is over? As I said, I think staffing issues uh, will persist for years after COVID is no longer a problem. Uh, we expect over the next five to 10 years for structural volumes to increase dramatically. Um, and I think that in the future, sites that are more efficient will thrive whereas sites that are less efficient will be challenged to accommodate all the new technology that's coming. Uh, besides aortic and mitral technology, uh, in the next few years, we're gonna have tricuspid technology, we're gonna have percutaneous uh, mitral replacement technologies, and all this volume will have to be accommodated. Also, we expect continued growth in TAVR and in existing mitral interventions, and with current protocols that may be hard to accommodate. Um, it's interesting that if you're looking 15 years back, um, PCI uh, went from inpatient procedures to outpatient in a lot of patients, and TAVR is in many ways reproducing this evolution. So uh, if you ever wanted to look at same-day discharge, uh, what's essential is to have a formal protocol uh, that you write uh, and that you stick with and make changes very slowly. It's important, it's essential that you set expectations from clinic uh, so patients understand that same day discharge is a possibility and they're not surprised. You need agreement of the entire team, but also equally important, you need agreement of the patient and family. If you're ever in doubt whether to send somebody home or not, keep them in patient. Um, the other thing that uh, is important to mention is that same day discharge is not a way to prevent the need for staffing on a daily basis. So we never anticipate that patients will go home the same day. We anticipate that everybody will, go, will stay. And if they go home the same day, that's great. But you should never anticipate that you do, let's say three towers today and everybody goes home because you don't know what's gonna happen during the procedure. And some of the patients that you anticipated will go home the same day may end up staying. So it helps staffing uh, in the big picture, but it will not help staffing 
uh, on a daily basis when you're planning your staffing uh, for the day. So that being said, uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to participate in this um, uh, conference and uh, I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pop. Uh, I missed uh, the introduction for us. So I'm Tae Jun Young from Seoul National University Bundang Hospital. My co-chair is Dr. Jung Sun Kim from Seoul Severance, Severance Hospital. Uh, next speaker will be Dr. Byung Hee Hwang from Seoul St. Mary's Hospital. He will discuss about the minimalist Tavin CMC. Dr. Hwang, please. Hello, my name is Pyongyu uh, uh, Hwang. Uh, today my topic is minimalist TAVI in CMC. And current TAVI indication is going more and more towards younger and low risk uh, patients. And in 2014, there has been this journal about minimalist approach versus standard approach. And it showed that the minimalist approach has uh, outcomes with uh, similar to standard approach. As you can see in this uh, journal, the length of stay and cost is more uh, better in the minimalist approach than the standard approach. And after the uh, treatment, event-free survival is uh, similar between two groups. So uh, in Korea, uh, we are doing, uh, we're, uh, not every group is doing minimalist TAVI, so I'm going to uh, introduce the concept of minimalist TAVI today. So minimal sedation, and there is the uh, tendency to general anesthesia. If you, we go to general anesthesia, we get intra PTE. But in minimal sedation, we do not do TE, but ICE or TTE. So we have to do a pre procedural workup. Uh, procedure towards uh, same day discharge or next day discharge. So how are we doing this minimum study in CMC? We're doing uh, monitored anesthesia care without general anesthesia, and we do not need uh, anesthesiologist. And we do only one femoral puncture and LV wire pacing, and we use proglide plus femoral seal instead two proglides, and this all leads towards early and safe discharge. So this is our protocol. We do this in this cat room. Uh, we train the uh, nurses to do this uh, monitored anesthesia care. So do, using midazolam and fentanyl, we use uh, watch the patient in fi uh, five minutes. And if the sedation is not uh, insufficient, then we give the patient more uh, medication. So in this journal in 2019, uh, monitored anesthesia care versus general anesthesia was uh, published. And as you can see, uh, monitored anesthesia care has uh, length of ICU stay and total hospital stay is lower than the general anesthesia. And as you can see, total anesthesia time is uh, shorter and procedure time is shorter in math. But in the device assist and early safety and clinical efficacy, there is no uh, difference between two groups. So we can do monitored and care safely in uh, TAVI patients. Uh, we use only one femoral puncture and we do LV wire pacing. So we do not have a femoral vein puncture and we use radial puncture for a pigtail. Uh, why we do this is that putting a 16 French sheath in the femoral artery, sometimes the pigtail can get skinked in the distal aorta because there's, in this distal aorta, there's very uh, stenosis and calcification. So uh, manipulation in the uh, 16 French pigtail is difficult when we use a large sheath. 
So this is our uh, procedure. One radial puncture for radial pigtail and the femoral uh, puncture for main device. And there is this uh, puncture needle, radial puncture leader in the subcutaneous for the wire pacing. And temporal lead can, uh, there are some cases that temporal lead can make some tamponade. And there is some cases that this torture stay, putting the temporal lead into the RV is sometimes some, uh, needs some work. So uh, this balloon tip can uh, make the temporal lead go into the RV uh, better, but sometimes it's very difficult to the severe torticity and the compression of the uh, vein. So we are doing LV wire pacing to this alligator clip, as you can see in the clip, to one clip is into the sapphire wire and one clip is into the uh, wire needle. Uh, so this is the sapphire wire and this is the negative uh, alligator and the positive alligator is clipped into the wire, uh, the needle, puncture needle in the subcutaneous. So this is the uh, procedure uh, clip. As you can see, this radial uh, puncture needle is inserted into the uh, opposite uh, subcutaneous and one clip is clipped into the needle and one clip is into the sapphire wire and after that, we are testing the pacemaker and it goes rapid pacing. After that, we uh, had Tavi. So this uh, journal uh, talk takes about direct wire pacing versus RV lead pacing in the easy Tavi. There were uh, 152 groups in both groups. And as you can see, uh, direct wire pacing has a procedure time more shorter than RV lead pacing. Uh, relative time reduction was about 12%. And secondary endpoint was radiation exposure and fluoroscopy time was shorter and the radiation was lesser. Uh, as in the efficacy, procedure success was 100% and the stimulation efficacy was almost similar. And in the secondary endpoint in MACE, uh, as you can see, uh, there was lesser uh, MACE in the uh, direct wire pacing groups. Uh, this was not such uh, relevant, but as you can see, Direct uh, RV lead pacing can cause more tamponade uh, to RV perforation and to annular rupture. This is our case doing uh, TAVI with LV wire pacing with a balloon expandable valve and self expandable valve. Both valve uh, we can do uh, safely with LV wire pacing. Finally, we are using a pro seal. Uh, in using two prolytes, there are about one or two percent. Two prolytes can cause the structure in the uh, puncture site. So after that, the structure in the puncture site, uh, it cannot be uh, treated with endovascular treatment. We have to do surgery and uh, cut down the prolyte. But we are now using one prolyte and put the femoral seal into the prolyte and uh, make the femoral seal into the proglide. So this is our uh, clip of doing this image. Put the wire and insert the knob, the longer one first, and the put femoral seal deep and put both knobs into the femoral seal.
then put the female seeder and clip the female seeder. It can be done relatively very easily than two prolytes. So this is my take home messages. Minimum TAVI is not the future, but it's the current. And we use minimal conspicuous sedation. And there's only one femoral puncture and LV wire pacing using prolyte and femoral seal. All leads towards early and safe discharge. After doing minimum TAVI in CMC, we are trying to do next day discharge. Same discharge after TAVI, it's some things yet to be considered, considered in Korea. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for your interesting lecture, for explaining very, uh, very uh, good uh, method of the minimalist TAVI procedure. So I will introduce the uh, next speaker. Next speaker is a robot, Gulli. He will uh, give uh, two lectures. First lecture, real-world experience with the Sentinel embolic protection device. And second one is an uh, introduction, the new generation accurate nail tooth valve fe fe features and benefits. Dr. Gruli, please. Invitation uh, to uh, be with you today. I am just going to Take two seconds because I believe I've got the wrong presentation up. So I'll end that one. And I think I'm meant to be talking about the Sentinel Cerebral Embolic Protection first. Sorry about that. So, Cerebral Embolic Protection. So why wouldn't you, I suppose, is the question that I would pose at the beginning of this. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, everyone will uh, be on board with the uh, similar thought process about why wouldn't you do this. Uh, having just listened to the last presentation, I suppose one issue would be that this does mean that we're going to be using the right radial artery. Uh, and we may have to then again rethink about what that second access point is and whether that becomes the left radial or whether everyone believes in this technology enough to go back to using the femoral artery for the alternate access. So one thing that uh, when we talk about this is common is people start to think, well, your stroke is going down. Is it really still an issue? But it is. And we know stroke remains an important complication of cardiac interventional procedures and particularly in TAVI. Uh, and the reported stroke rate is still around that two to four percent. But even that is likely to be an underestimation of the real rate of uh, stroke. And that's because we've got different definitions and different uh, methods of trying to elicit uh, stroke. So if we have an independent urologist looking for the stroke as opposed to the cardiology unit coming past on their ward round, uh, then those stroke rates change. And in fact, in a lot of the cerebral embolic protection trials where there is an independent neurologist, the rate of stroke is approaching 10%, if not higher. But in addition to that 10%, we know that if we actually image and look for cerebral insult with an MRI, we see diffusion weighted imaging lesions in nearly 100% of patients. And while we'll often use the term silent infarction in these uh, instances, there's also a push to, uh, as to whether silent infarcts really have no clinical impact at all but rather do they also have an impact on subtle neurocognitive changes? And are those neurocognitive changes really benign, particularly as we move towards lower risk patients being treated with this technology? And is that going to impact their quality of life and their ability to sustain independent living into the future? Or does this put them behind the eight ball as far as future cognitive issues? As far as the timing of stroke, we know that the majority of stroke is periprocedural, happening within that first 24 hours. But we also see quite a significant number within the first three days. And some of this is likely to be actually unrecognised procedural stroke. Patients are either in some institutions still having general anaesthesia, which delays the recognition of the stroke, 
or even when they're done under sedation, that sedation wearing off and uh, people feeling that those initial changes are due to sedation or delirium, delaying that incidence uh, or delaying that early recognition. So we also know quite a lot from these cerebral embolic protection trials about what causes stroke during these procedures. And we can find debris captured in these filters in nearly 100% of patients following a TAVI. The debris includes a range of things, things that we would have thought of like thrombus, but also things that we didn't really think would be in these baskets. Not only valve tissue, but also myocardium, plastic and foreign material. And in fact, nearly half of patients have at least one particle that's greater than one millimetre in diameter. So pretty big uh, amounts of debris that can cause quite significant impact to the cerebral circulation. So still, I'm sure there's people in the audience and people in my own hospital that would argue that really, I don't see a lot of stroke. It's not a problem for me. It might be in these registries. It might be in these randomised trials, but surely stroke rates are coming down. Well, if we look through the TVT registry, and this is kind of pre-COVID data now, but we didn't see stroke rates coming down. They maintained at these levels. And again, this is a TVT self-reported registry. So we're seeing those lower rates of stroke in around the 2 to 3%, recognising that there'll be a lot of unrecognised stroke above this that would put this back into those same percentages. But really from 2012, in that five-year period, no reduction in the rate of stroke. Other people would say, but I use these new generation devices and wires, and so surely the rates of stroke are coming down. Well, again, here we can see that new generation devices compared with early generation devices, no statistically significant reduction in the rate of stroke. And then there'll be others who say, yes, but these are because there's a whole heap of low volume operators out there who are on the learning curve. They're only doing a small number of procedures. And I do a, um, a high volume operator at a high volume center, I don't see these same number of strokes. But again, out of the TVT registra, registry, we can see as far as most other complications, that's true. Our mortality is better, our bleeding is better, our vascular injury is better if we're a high volume operator at a high volume center. But highlighted in the red square there on the bottom right, we can see this doesn't pertain to stroke. High volume centres, high volume operators still have a same uh, percentage of stroke cases. So this isn't an issue that's going away. Some people might be out there saying, but I use solely Edwards, I use their solely Medtronic, and this is a slightly old slide, so it also has the Lotus device in it. But we can see the rate of uh, stroke is similar in all of these cases, and the risk reduction by using cerebral embolic protection is similar across the device types. So how can we reduce TAVI related stroke? Cerebral embolic protection devices. And while many have come and some of these are still under uh, investigation, the one device that has in most markets reached clinical use is the Sentinel embolic protection device. And this is now owned by Boston Scientific. So this includes two independent filters to capture, but not only capture, also remove the embolic materia. So as opposed to deflection devices that sit in the aorta and send the debris downstream into the lower circulation, this actually captures and removes that uh, debris. There are two filters. They have a pore size of 140 microns, and it's inserted via a generally right radial approach and if uh, that's not feasible by a right uh, brachial approach. Has the two filters, one that sits in the innominate vessel or the brachiocephalic, and then a deflectable tip that allows uh, cannulation and insertion of the distal filter into the left common carotid artery. This device uh, was initially investigated in the clean TAVI study. So this was uh, only 100 patients randomized to uh, have the device or not. This was not powered to show a clinical difference, but did show a reduction in the number and volume of lesions on MRI if patients had the uh, device implanted. Most of the rest of the data until uh, some upcoming trials has, has been from independent single centre registries, but they've been showing remarkably similar results. 
So the relative risk reduction for stroke across three large centres, Ulm, Cedar sinai and Erasmus, have all shown a roughly a 70 to 80% relative risk reduction in the rate of stroke. So very consistent results. The US IDE trial uh, was also uh, reported a few years ago now. Um, and it took the patients into either a control arm to not have the device, an imaging arm who had the device and followed up with, CT, uh, with MRI imaging, and a safety arm who didn't have the MRI but looking for any safety um, cost of using this device via the radial artery. And it was a negative trial. So as far as its primary endpoint, there was no statistically significant reduction in 30-day MACE rates. Um, but when on post hoc analysis, um, on the pre-specified pre look at 72 hours, Again, we see this 63% relative risk reduction in the rate of stroke. And you could argue that really these are the strokes that we think we're going to pre prevent is those at the time of the procedure. If we look at a 30 day outcome, we start to cloud the results here with things that are unrelated to the procedure and we're never going to be reduced by putting a, a device in only for the time of the procedure. We also got from this trial that it's a very safe thing to do. It added on average four minutes to the procedure time. There was no significant increase in contrast use and 99.6% safe and successful delivery and retrieval. Those extra 0.4% were access related hematomas. So also things that were easily managed. So a very safe thing to do for a likely two third relative risk reduction in the rate of stroke. So what does this look like? And hopefully some people are already using this, but this is uh, actually a slightly old case again. You'll see when you see the uh, valve type that was used in this case. But a 76-year-old female with symptomatic severe tri-leaflet aortic stenosis, no history of stroke, moderately calcified aortic annulus, but was the primary caregiver for her disabled husband. So there's nothing here other than being female, which we know is associated with a high risk of stroke, that really jumps out of us. It's not a valve in valve, it's not a bicuspid valve, none of those other risk factors for stroke in this case. And so this will come to one of the other questions I would pose later, but if we're not going to use it in everyone who does get this device, and you could have said this lady doesn't, but if she suffers a stroke and she's the primary caregiver for her disabled husband, then we have two people who are going to end up in uh, care facilities. Uh, so a major impact. So hopefully this plays, but this is showing a standard sentinel deployment. Uh, so generally we've got an aortogram first that shows us where we're going to deploy our um, device. Initially come down by the radial approach over an 014 wire and we have a little puff of contrast that's going to show us where to deploy this filter so that we're still below the uh, vertebral artery on the right hand side. We deflect the tip and we use the wire to wire the left common carotid. We pull up onto the arch and then we push forward to deploy uh, that left common carotid filter and the device is implanted. So you can imagine how we're able to get that four uh, minute deployment. You can position the device in different ways uh, during, you can leave the arm out to the side um, or you can bring it in adjacent to the patient uh, during the procedure. Uh, and sorry, I won't let that replay. Here you can see why this is an old case because uh, traversing here, you can see the um, Lotus Edge device, really here just to highlight that lack of interaction between the TAVI device coming across the arch and the device sitting nicely up in the uh, roof of the arch. I won't go through the whole deployment um, for the sake of time. Um, for those who miss uh, Lotus Edge, you can see a very nice Lotus Edge valve in uh, the historical uh, note. And then I will let you see how quickly we can recapture the Sentinel device here, uh, which is really just reversing those steps. So catching the distal filter, advancing out of the uh, common carotid, advancing the device and then pulling back on the filter. And that was actually not a sped up uh, video. And this is probably what we see in the majority of cases is that sand-like debris. 
um, which some would look at and think, oh, that's a bit underwhelming. But really, I prefer to have that in a basket on the table than in my brain. Uh, sorry, again, I'll just make that move on. Hopefully. Okay. And so, again, I'm, uh, for the sake of time, very briefly, seeing a device being implanted here, proximal filter in position, um, coming up, flexing the tip, wiring, pulling up onto the arch, and then advancing the distal filter. Um, here, a Edwards valve traversing with no interaction between that and the uh, sentinel device, and then recapture of the device. Again, very simple, straightforward of capturing those filters coming out of the uh, common carotid, straightening the device, and then recapturing the um, proximal filter and taking all of that debris with us rather than leaving it behind or sending it downstream. Uh, as per some of the deflection devices where, of course, that's some of that stuff is going to end up in the kidneys and in the gut and uh, trashing the legs. Here, slightly more impressive, you can see a red thrombus. Uh, this was actually sent off to pathology and the green arrow there actually highlighting a little bit of a leaflet material uh, that had come off during the procedure. So do we need more evidence before we start to use this routinely? Well, that is coming. We have the protected TAVER trial, which was a randomised trial in uh, relatively all comers. And looking at that 72-hour endpoint, that's completed enrolment. Uh, we were lucky enough to participate in that trial and it's due to report at TCT this year. And it's a very similar trial that's running as a, in England with investigator-initiated trial, again, randomising patients to have the device or not, and uh, looking at over 7,000 people in that trial. And there's already pre-specified um, uh, review that will do a um, review of both of those trials together. So in conclusion, stroke remains a common and devastating complication of TAVA. Stroke impacts mortality and morbidity and carries a significant financial, physical, psychological and societal impact. Cerebral embolic protection appears to reduce the incidence of clinical stroke by approximately 75% relative risk reduction. And it's a safe technology with no increase in adverse event rates uh, and no increase in procedural duration. So back to my initial uh, question, why wouldn't you use it? Thank you. So... Yeah, Dr. Robot, Gulli, do you, yes. do, I think, do you have another lecture? So it's, it's, I do. Yeah. So Let me just continue the next it. lecture. And if possible, I think you had better finish within 10 minutes. Then 10 minutes. We have Perfect. Some, yeah, yeah. We have some time to discuss for the topics. Let me change it over. Just wanted to show you the same one again. Here we go. So next topic is accurate Neo2, which again, hopefully some people have had the advantage of using and I'll try and whip through this a bit quicker. So the design features, this is the valve. It's a super annular TAVI valve. It has this upper crown and lower crown, which help to engage the annulus and a paravalvular leak mitigation system with this skirt around the outside. It has a bit of a marker there to help us position during deployment. As opposed to Accurate Neo, the original design, we have an expanded skirt here to help reduce that paravalvular leak. This has that marker to help us uh, uh, also position the device very accurately. And so here we're aiming for not quite as shallow as a deployment as many other devices. One of the significant advantages of the Accurate Valve is a very low pacemaker rate. And as such, we actually aim to put this in at approximately six millimeter depth. And that gives us that maximal radial force uh, at that position. But it also helps to bring those leaflet, native leaflets down under the upper crown and maintain coronary access, which is one of the distinct advantages. Some of the other changes, as I mentioned, the uh, radio opaque marker, 
This is implanted via a 14 French expandable proprietary sheath with the eye sleeve, and it has a new tip and flexible uh, end to the delivery system to aid uh, a deployment into even a very horizontal aorta or a vertical valve lie. Some of the advantages here are that we have these upper crowns and stabilisation arches that as those are deployed, we still maintain leaflet function in the native valve. So we have no period of requiring rapid pacing and no period of hemodynamic instability. And then after that's achieved, we then have this very rapid release of the last phase. Um, so no obstruction to outflow at all. At present, on the left of the slide, we have Acura Neo2. It comes in a small, medium and large device, allowing us to treat annuli between approximately 21 and 27 millimetres. I was actually uh, lucky to run the accurate Prime XL trial, which is going to see expansion into a new XL device that's completed enrolment. So that'll expand us up to 29 millimetres. And there's a future platform looking at uh, changes again to continue that uh, low PVL rates and improve the procedural ease with things such as commercial alignment. So here's a case example. This patient, uh, annulus-wise, perimeter derived of 26.2 millimetres, very similar dimensions in the LVOT, tri-leaflet valve, and uh, decent sinus capacity. So the plan here for a right femoral approach using the 14 French eye sleeve. One of the things that we have moved towards, and you'll see in some of the uh, evidence coming up, is a significant pre-dilatation. So here, a 25 millimetre pre-dilatation, and then placing the uh, large accurate NEO. So you can see the initial aortogram, and then you can see that 25 millimeter full-size BAV performed here. We tend to use a true balloon, so a very non-compliant balloon. So the device is inserted, as we said, through that uh, sheath here over a safari guide wire. So it expands the sheath as it comes up. And then on the right-hand side, you can see as it comes through the end of that sheath, you can see that expanding. Tracks really nicely over the wire and is very flexible up through the arch with very minimal interaction. And then the aim is to deploy this and to bring it down on the greater curvature so that that marker just approaches the annulus. And we do this very gently. We don't want to end up too deep. And we're really aiming to have that marker sit nicely on the annular plane. That sets us up for success here where we're going to end up with that exact six millimetre depth. It's a top-down deployment. So you can see on the left here, the first stage is the release of what we call those upper crowns, which are going to sit over the top of the native leaflets and help capture and push those down. And then the next step is release of those stabilisation arches in the aorta, which helps to keep us coaxial. And then we have the final release of the device. So we confirm that we're in the right position. It hasn't moved. The mark is still sitting nicely on the annular plane. And then you'll see here a very swift release. What I haven't gone through here is also the ability to achieve commissural alignment by knowing where those three posts of the device are sitting. And here you can see the one post out on the greater curve, two on the inner aspect, telling us that we are going to have achieved commissural alignment. Finally, device in position and the fire in all a autogram. Still here with a stiff wire across, uh, but you can see a very nice, uh, sorry, removing the device first, and then I will show you the final a autogram. Uh, showing that six millimeter depth, no coronary obstruction, and really pushing those native leaflets down under the uh, native uh, coronaries. So clinical data-wise, as far as the NEO2, we have early NEO2 registry data in over 500 patients uh, showing very little paravalvular leak. So again, similar to other devices on the market, 1.3% uh, greater than mild paravalvular leak, very low gradients. It's a superannular valve, so 9 millimeter post-procedural echo gradient, and very low pacemaker rates in a real-world registry of 6% here. Uh, so really class leading pacemaker rates. If we then look at a, a match comparison between NEO and NEO2 in the same cohort, we can see significantly lower amounts of regurgitation compared to the original NEO valve. 
A similar registry out of Italy here, leading to NEO versus NEO2 in match comparison. You can see a very well matched cohort here and very similar baseline conduction abnormalities. And you can see we now move towards more pre-dilatation and less post-dilatation with NEO2, but a lower procedural duration, lower use of contrast. And you can see much higher technical success of 97.6. So VARC2 here, suggesting that we're not getting gradients of over 20, we're not getting moderate PVL. Uh, so very high procedural success and very low pacemaker rates in this registry of around 7%. We maintain that hemodynamic uh, compared to NEO, and we've got much less paravalvular leak. We also have some head-to-head -head data coming out with match con uh, comparison to uh, Sapien Ultra. Uh, you can see we have much lower gradients at the end of this. So an average of nine millimeters of mercury compared to 34 millimeters of mercury with Ultra. Sorry, percentage of patients. Here, 9.8% of, of patients having greater than 20, 2.6% having uh, greater than 20 with NEO2, and much lower rates of patient prosthesis mismatch. So very important, particularly in patients who are going to have a small annular area to begin with. You can see here we're matching ultra as far as less than mild paravalvular regurgitation. In fact, we've got less. And over on the right-hand side, you can see a significant difference with those gradients. So it is statistically significant as far as the lower gradients. We also have the Comma Line trial, which has come out of Lars Sondergaard's uh, group, single center trial here, but showing in valves that uh, tell us that we are able to achieve commissural alignment, that we don't always do it. So with Evolute, in 10% of patients, we still have moderate or severe misalignment. With Portico, a quarter of patients still misaligned. With Accurate Neo, no patients misaligned. And then that leads to the improved ability to reaccess the coronaries. So here out of Catania in um, Italy, Marco Babanti's group, 100% of patients treated with the Accurate Neo, they were able to get back into the coronary and reaccess, as opposed to only 82% with Evolute R and 99% with Sapien. I won't go through any of this, but this is still enrolling in the US, uh, which will compare Accurate Neo2 to other commercially available uh, devices. That's, I think, about two thirds enrolled. And as I mentioned, I was lucky to be the PI on the Accurate Prime XL, which has completed enrollment and will see expansion into the 29 millimeter valve system. So in conclusion, the Accurate Neo2 incorporates new skirt technology that actively seals and prevents PVL. The initial clinical experience is fantastic. It has design features that may actually offer advantages over other currently available devices. And hopefully we'll be able to confirm those findings in the accurate IDE trial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation, including cerebral protection device and new device of the Teva. So it's time to discuss for this topic. Uh, at first, I would like to introduce a full expert of TAVR as a panelist, Kang do Seoul, uh, Seoul Asan Medical Center, Park tae Samsung Medical Center, Park Kyung-min, Ulsan University Hospital, Lee Kyu-sung, uh, Daejeon St. Mary Hospital. Please, is, is there any question or comments yeah, to the uh, presenters? Uh, Thank you for your nice lectures, and uh, I have a, a comment and question to Dr. Gulli. Uh, your uh, lecture was so fantastic, and I learned a lot. And about the, the cerebral protection device, I think that the problem is that the low risk, low rate of the clinically significant stroke. In our recent uh, hospital data, the significant stroke after top was less than 1%. So uh, I want to ask, ask your strategy for using the cerebral protection device. Do you routinely use the cerebral protection device for whole top patient? Or do you have any your selective criteria for high risk uh, patient? So at present, I use it in anyone who's anatomically suitable while awaiting further randomized data. Um, I think that less than 1% still means that one in 100 patients have a stroke. And who wants to be the one in 100? 
And at the moment, I don't think we have enough way of predicting who that one in 100 is going to be. We do know that there are some risk factors, female patients. Well, that's going to mean that we're still putting our device into a significant number of them. Uh, valve in valve procedures, bicuspid valves, uh, some evidence whether we did a calcium score on the valve and having more calcium. If they've had a toe and they've got arch atheroma. But by the time we try to pick out all of those people and say, well, they're the only ones that are going to get it, we're putting in a, putting the cerebral protection into a lot of people. So I think, yes, we probably, most of us feel that our stroke rates aren't as high as what's reported. But I don't want to necessarily be the one who has that risk of stroke myself if I have a TAVI. I don't want my parents to be the one who has that one in a hundred risk and I want to reduce that by two thirds if I can, relative risk reduction. Um, so yeah, at the moment, everyone, um, and uh, hopefully we will eventually either be able to have better predictors of who should get it or we'll get better randomised data that will tell us whether this is going to be cost effective. Oh, I also have a question to uh, Dr. Kuli. Thank you for your valuable uh, lecture. Uh, I have actually I have no uh, experience about the Sentinel uh, device, but uh, I know that uh, there is a, a, a some complex issue uh, about kinking catheters uh, between Sentinel catheter with uh, uh, pigtail. So, do you have any experience about that? Uh, complex uh, complication, and uh, do you have um, any advice for avoiding that issue? Yeah, so um, I've kind of gone through pretty quickly the deployment of the device there, but we do have a pigtail that's often sitting in the arch, and if you haven't road mapped that, you may have left your pigtail in. So as we come down and flex up to intubate the left common carotid we would routinely pull back on that pigtail to ensure that we're not through the pigtail with the wiring. Uh, at that stage, it's pretty straightforward to get out of there. I think one of the issues that people can get into trouble with is anatomy that they probably shouldn't have gone into to begin with. So our CTs do include a review of the anatomy to make sure there's not excessive tortuosity of the vasculature. Uh, but the other thing that can cause issues sometimes is when they're wired the common carotid and then start to rotate the device round and round and wrap that wire and then lose track of which way they've manipulated the device and have to try and get it out. Uh, but if everyone, if you follow a standard deployment, you're not putting it into anatomy that you probably shouldn't have to begin with. And at worst case scenario, you only deploy the brachiocephalic filter, you're still protecting half of your cerebral circulation and you can proceed with the TAVI without having deployed the uh, common carotid filter. So it would be a very rare thing. It's not, I've not ever had to pull a surgeon or not be able to re uh, remove the device percutaneously, uh, either in my own practice or proctoring the device. So it's nothing I've had personal experience of uh, getting into that situation. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Pop. Uh, for the the same day uh, discharge after the tower, uh, I think uh, we have should have more the strict the criteria the, than the conventional the discharge the patient. So what is the most important factor for the, the same day discharge? Well, um, I think there are several important factors. Um, number one, we have to make sure that there are absolutely no complications, no access side complications. Uh, anybody that has bleeding after the procedure uh, will have to stay overnight. Um, but if you haven't had bleeding uh, for four hours while you're li laying in bed, and then you've ambulated for two hours and you haven't had a problem, it's very unlikely that you're going to go home and have a problem. Uh, the second type of complication that people are really afraid of is conduction system problems. And if you haven't had a conduction system problem at baseline, if you don't have a conduction system problem after the procedure or intra-procedurally, we have not yet seen with the Edwards platform a single case that developed a delay AV block that did not have some sort of prolongation of the conduction 
between uh, either uh, AV conduction or interventricular conduction. Now, if you're talking about self-expanding valves, that's very well described that that can happen late um, with, uh, let's say, Metronic or any of the other self-expanding valves. Uh, that's why in our protocol, uh, we only allowed self-expanding valves if they were being deployed inside a valve-in-valve -valve situation and without cracking. But uh, with uh, the Edwards valve, uh, we don't have that concern if you're gonna have a conduction system problem, it's gonna present early on. Thank you. Uh, I have also a question to Dr. Park. So you mentioned the uh, uh, access complication is the uh, uh, first to uh, change for same dis uh, day discharge. So do you have any change of uh, vascular uh, treatment strategy, uh, such as uh, uh, closing device or anticoagulation protocol? So we continue to use uh, two per close devices. Uh, there is some data, some people argue that a single per close device is actually better. Uh, we're looking at that, but currently we use two, two uh, per close devices. Uh, two things that are seemingly minor, but have made a tremendous difference for us. And this is stuff that we again learned from the experience of David uh, Wood's group in Vancouver. Uh, basically, uh, patients, all patients get protamine at the end of the case. We use heparin followed by protamine. And uh, we check an ACT at the end of the procedure. Uh, and uh, we try to get the ACT to be uh, less than uh, 180. Um, if they're higher than 180, uh, generally we'll give a bit more protamine. Uh, the other thing that makes a tremendous difference it probably doesn't decrease major vascular complications, but it certainly decreases nuisance bleeds that a lot of times are what keeps the patients in the hospital and in bed, uh, is 15 minutes of manual compression at the end of the procedure. So uh, basically our protocol is uh, the two per close devices are uh, deployed, uh, tightened at the end of the procedure, um, and uh, as we do that, we also administer protamine uh, 10 minutes after protamine administration, while pressure is being held, uh, the uh, technician uh, checks an ACT and in rare cases administers extra protamine. And uh, then they continue to hold pressure for a total of uh, 15 minutes. Uh, while the patient is on the table having pressure being held, uh, we do a neurologic exam to make sure that we don't have any complications. And uh, at the same time, uh, somebody checks Doppler pulses, uh, which allows us to know whether there's any uh, vascular uh, problems. Uh, just like the uh, uh, team uh, in Seoul, uh, we use radial access for our secondary access, and the uh, radial band is on, radial catheter is only removed after uh, 15 minutes when we, we're sure that uh, there's no access site complications and when we checked an ACT. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's time to close this session because of the time limitation. So thanks for, for three speakers and four panelists for the uh, very educational uh, presentation and discussion. And so thanks again to joining this session and enjoy rest of this symposium. Thank you.